Welcome to the Sunken Temple, or the Temple of Atal Hakkar, the Phase 3 sod raid that sends mixed signals. We don't want you to discover the layout of the dungeon, so we blocked off every path that doesn't lead you to our linear narrative. And unlike in Nomer, we're not going to kill you this time if you decide to deviate from that path. The glowy wall will just say no. However, we do want to reuse assets, just not in a puzzly fashion. The iconic snake statues. Yes, kill the mobs and watch the beam go away. Also to get here, use a rope. An innovative device used to. Ascend floors. How do we get down here again? Stairs. Yeah, stairs. We, we just couldn't. We couldn't? It's bloody carnage up here. What? What about the downstairs set? Oversight. No, I take it back. I'll hail the rope. I am ready to neck. Putting a pin in that onto the raid guide. A tall Alarion. Alarion? This. This boss starts off with a trap gimmick. If you do not clear out the mobs above this arena, deactivating the statues, the boss will start with a permanent 500% increase in damage. Unless you are watching this video in the future and you are able to kill this boss in 30 seconds, do not attempt this. This boss is a tank and spank with mild coordination required. His main ability is demolishing smash. Roughly every 30 seconds he will cast this ability, knocking everyone in the raid back, dealing damage to them. As well as knocking the tank straight up into the air, wiping their threat, causing them to need to taunt when they land. This works in tandem with this coordination gimmick, Pillars of Might. Two of these are usually cast before any demolishing smash, producing four to six pillars with each cast. For each pillar that remains active, his damage increases by 5%. Positioning players in front of the statues relative to the boss. When Demolishing Smash is cast, it will cause them to get knocked into the statues, destroying them, and sometimes bonking off of them instead of getting launched 45 yards. The entirety of this fight is keeping your tank alive, not getting behind on statues, and healing the raid to full before every Demolishing Smash goes out. With the Guzu Golf Gopher put out of commission, you can go back the way you came to the lobby and a new entryway will be open for you. Leading up a staircase with mobs on every flat until you reach the upper ring that is surprisingly empty. Something ate them. This is your problem now, bud. And now it's going to eat me. Oh my god. Festering Rot Slime. This fight is kind of a gimmick in and of itself. When you begin the boss encounter, there are objects on the walls that become attackable. They also melee back for a mild amount of damage. Go figure. When they are killed, they are placed into a spot lined up with the center of that hallway. They exist in this spot for seven seconds before despawning and beginning the timer to respawn another one in the place where you just killed one. This is a needed mechanic in order to counter the boss's movement. The boss has two phases. A movement phase where every three seconds he is slowly accumulating 5% movement speed. And then his wretch phase. This is where he is rooted in place after consuming three objects by running over them before they despawn a visual indication by the objects being stuck in his model as he is accumulating them, causing him to cast Wretch, which hits everybody in the raid, visually removing all those objects when this occurs, sprinkled in between his normal abilities. This resets his movement speed. The route seemingly lasts 10 seconds, completing up to three revolting Wretch casts. I say up to because I have visual information where he moves after doing it twice sometimes. Even during that route, he is accumulating speed. So even though it reset to zero, by the time he starts moving again, it's up to 20%. His main annoying ability is called Gunk. This targets three people in your raid, applying a dot that lasts for 20 seconds that reduces movement speed by 75% and is a cleansable disease. When cleansed, it leaves a three yard radius puddle on the ground. This puddle is called Nauseous Gas. It deals 500 damage every second and hinders casting and melee attack speed by 75%. This is also periodically placed under the boss. These puddles last for two minutes total. So if you kite him the whole way around the rim in two minutes, you could be in a bad way. Lastly, he has a devour ability and aura. The aura, if you are within 13 yards of him, you will take nature damage over time. The ability, if you are inside the center of his hitbox, you will become vehicled to him. You will then gain a breath meter indicating that you will suffocate if this lasts long enough. He can opt to melee you if he focuses you as his main target. And you will take his periodic damage over time, whether it's from his poison on the ground or himself. This lasts on the player until he is set into a wretch phase where he is forced to expel every object he has consumed. You are more likely to never encounter this mechanic as you would have to be adamant in getting eaten and standing inside of him in order for him to perform this ability on you. 
outside of a niche scenario where if you are his main focused target and you decide to jump onto one of the ledges on the wall, causing him to utilize the ability teleport player, putting you directly inside of him. Outside of the niche scenario of being the tank, quote, and being out of bounds, the devour mechanic is easily avoidable. This fight pretty much goes, if your melee wail on the boss from the rim of his hitbox, avoid the crap on the ground. If you're ranged, fight him from a distance, avoid the crap on the ground. Smack down the objects that are in his path, but not so far away that they'll despawn. Heal through the wretch phase, and cleanse the gunk when people are along the walls. Kiting away and whittling him down until he dies. You then make your way to one of the old mini-boss platforms, looking over the main hub. It is here you will drop down and begin the next boss encounter. The Atalai defenders can be relatively easy or semi-difficult depending on your composition. Every time a defender dies, it'll resurrect itself three seconds afterward, becoming undead and basically doing everything that it was doing prior. If you have shackles and hunter traps, you're pretty set for this fight. Paladins can turn undead, but asking them to do that every 15 seconds is pain. But it is an option. If you don't have any form of CC of this manner, attempting to kill them again will only bring them down to 0% health. Though this will put them at a death slow, they will still use their abilities actively. There is a comp requirement to make this fight manageable. So on to the fight. You'll begin by fighting one of six trolls. Your first will be Zolor. He periodically casts an annoying debuff called Frailty, which reduces your stats by 10. Anyone within 10 yards of him. This can be dispelled by magic. Every 10 to 20 seconds, he will charge to a random player, winding up a corrupted slam. Anyone within 5 yards of him after the end of this 3 second cast will take the damage from that slam, as well as be stunned for 2 seconds. This is an avoidable mechanic. When he's dead, he resurrects himself. Mijan enters the fray. He will buff himself with thorns, damaging anyone who does melees to him. This can be dispelled. He summons 9 snake totems in a nice little knit circle. These should be focused on a killed, or... If it's his ghost form off in yonder, ignored, because if you're more than 20 yards from them, they cannot harm you. If they are left in range and ignored, they will chip away at people's health, doing 300 damage per cast. Healing Ward is useless, but kill it because it's there. Renew is basically in the same kit, and he does a healing wave, you can interrupt it. All of his heals are pretty lackluster. After Mijan dies, resurrects, Zolo will become active. Zolo has an obnoxious skeleton totem that will spawn a skeleton when placed in every 5 seconds if left up. His chain lightning is absolutely punishing and should be interrupted. The intervals are about 5 seconds. And lastly is his unstable cask. If you have shamans on your team, grounding totem will get rid of this mechanic outright. It's essentially the chain lightning version of a stun. If ever gets hit by it, someone 10 yards from them, 10 yards from them, 10 yards from them. It stuns up to 5 people for 2 seconds. After Zolo goes down, resurrects, Gasher would like to battle. His most apparent ability is Fervor. Every melee swing, he will increase his melee attack speed by 10% and movement speed by 10%. This stacks indefinitely, and you should kill him soon. He also has an ability called Spinning Axes. These rotate around him, doing damage in a 5 yard radius as it's rotating. Like two Ravagers, but dancing? A better analogy would be that it's Bladestorm with gaps on the side, constantly rotating. If your tank is getting trucked, your melee should avoid this. This lasts for a total of 10 seconds. You can peel off. It is fine. Or you can move with the gaps. Gasher. K.O. Oh no. Loro. Loro does a shield slam. This stuns the tank for 2 seconds. Also wiping their threat. Every 12 seconds, he'll cast improved blocking for 6 seconds. Does little to save him and mostly just annoys your tank. He has a hard cast demo shout. You should interrupt this if you value your melee or physical DPS. He sometimes disarms anyone within 8 yards of him. This is a 2 second cast. Loru goes dead and re-dead. Last up is Huku. Huku has a Shadow Bolt. It's interruptible. Shadow Bolt Volley. Interruptible. He summons 3 imps. Lol. He does Curse of Blood on the tank that can be cleansed. And that is all of the Atali defenders. Now don't celebrate too early. We gotta bring back Mechatork's favorite feature. Activating the next boss by a proximity trigger. If your raid is not ready within 30 seconds and anyone is within that green inset in the center of the room, you will activate the next encounter. And your first reaction might be to salvage and run away, and this is your downfall. The bosses will touch down and begin patrolling the inner and outer ring. Once aggroed, there is a three second window before caustic overflow becomes a thing. If everyone repositioned to the center, they're fine. However, if they got far away from the center, attempting to avoid initiating altogether, they are now SOL, as Caustic Overflow does 1000 damage every half second, slowing them by 40%. 
Once you know it's a thing, you won't fall for it again. How dare you not be immediately ready for the next fight, gawking at the loot. Dream Scythe and Weaver. The fight begins with Dream Scythe doing a three second cast called Caustic Overflow. This limits the playing field to the dais that dips into the center of the room. Weaver puts Emerald Ward on himself, reducing all damage taken by 99%, and begins to do the Dalaran 500. Dream Scythe, however, wants smoke. He sports a frontal cone called Acid Breath. This does 750 nature damage, and a stacking dot that does 215 nature damage every second, for 45 seconds. This is a burden on the tank, and should be faced away from the raid so it isn't a burden to anyone else. You will likely need two tanks for this encounter. His ability is cast at 10 to 20 second intervals. He also does an ability called Wing Flap. This does no damage, it just knocks people back that are in front of the boss. And now the main attraction to this encounter is the Wing Buffet mini phase. Around every 30 seconds, he will position himself at either the north or the south rim of the dais. He will then knock everyone in the cardinal direction that he is facing. The only way that you are going to land into the hole is if you were staring him dead in the eyes in his melee range, lined up with the hole, as any other location will make it impossible for you to land in said hole. You whittle him down to 80%, and then Weaver comes in, tagging him out, where Dream Scythe will now do the Dalaran 500. There's no real discernible difference between Dream Scythe or Weaver. They both do roughly the same damage and have the same attack speed. Weaver has all the abilities of Dream Scythe, except he has two variations to his Wing Buffet called Delayed Wing Buffet. Instead of being a two second cast, it's 3.5. Instead of positioning north or south, he positions west or east. At 60%, Dream Scythe is sick of running around and he joins into the fray. You now have to deal with both dragons at the same time, but since they share a health pool, this is a damage increase for anyone who can cleave. Roughly every 20 to 30 seconds, they will do a combined wing buffet, where Dream Scythe will go off from the north or south, and Weavers will go off from the west or east, with a second and a half in between them. These combined don't threaten to knock anyone in the hole unless they're in really dumb spots. Similar for getting knocked out of the rim as a descended platform works in your favor. 60% to zero, it's a DPS check, unless you have a way for your tank to clear their stacks. Eventually, Acid Breath will get high enough if the fight drags on to kill your tank. To summarize, face the bosses away, don't be in bad positions for the knockback, heal the raid to full between the double buffets, and GG, you've killed Dream Scythe and Weaver. You then make your way to the Lair of the Chosen, where your melee will start believing in ghosts, and pets will get feared, pulling an overwhelming amount of trash. Welcoming you to the cult is Jamalin the Prophet and his sidekick, Ogum the Wretched. Jamalin has a buff called Ritual Leader, healing him for 20% of his health every second. What is a leader without followers? This persists until Ogum the Wretched is killed. You may want two tanks for this fight. Jamalin casts three abilities throughout phase one. Smite, which focuses his tank target. You do not have to interrupt this as the damage is negligible. Holy Fire, which hits up to five targets with instant holy damage and a damage over time effect that can be dispelled. This can be interrupted, and should at every turn. And last is Holy Nova. This produces two holy bolts that travel to the location of two raid members. When it lands, it produces a six yard pulsating AoE. That damages every second, and lasts for 45 seconds. 250 holy damage per pulse. The main focus target of phase one is Ogum the Wretched. Roughly every 25 seconds, he will cast Agonizing Weakness. This will affect 10 people, dealing damage and reducing their damage done by 50%. This is a curse and should be dispelled as soon as possible. On his tank target, he will cast Mortal Lash. This deals 500 shadow damage and reduces healing taken by 50%, lasting for 12 seconds. After you beat Ogum the Wretched into the dirt, the Ritual Leader buff will disappear, and Jamalan the Prophet will begin draining Ogum the Wretched. This is flavor RP in free DPS time. He will no longer attempt to smite or holy fire. On top of still using Holy Nova, he gains Shadow Sermon Pain. Every 20 seconds, he will put a magic debuff on 10 people, dealing 600 shadow damage every 2 seconds. This should be dispelled as soon as possible. Every 15 seconds, he will cast Power Word Shield. This absorbs 100,000 damage taken. This should be purged or dispelled as soon as it comes up. Every 30 seconds, he will cast Psychic Scream. This can affect up to 8 people. It has a 2.5 second cast. You can avoid this outright by running away from him, as it affects anyone within 8 yards of him, and 2.5 seconds is more than enough time to break away. And lastly is Massive Penance. Everyone in the raid will take 1.5k holy damage over the course of 3 seconds. Summary. Beat down Ogum the Wretched. Dispel the curses. Kick Holy Fire. Don't stand in the broadcast of Holy Novas. Phase 2. Dispel Power Word Shield. Cleanse Shadow Sermon Pain. Step away for Psychic Scream. Avoid the Holy Novas being broadcast on the ground. Top the raid through Mass Penance. And that is the end of Jamalan's Cult. Now this is unique. 
I've heard of clearing bosses to prevent trash from spawning. However, this might be the first time I've come across clearing bosses to cause trash to spawn. You clear the way toward the Chamber of the Dreamer, where you will find Hazaz doing what his family does best. Nyong. Bear with me on this one. The Huzaz in Morphaz fight is, if not unpolished, unfinished. It is scuffed to say the least. More into that after I explain the fight. Hazaz has three abilities. The one concerning your raid is Dreamer's Lament. This is a dot that does 2,000 damage to six people over the course of 10 seconds. It's cast every 15 to 20 seconds. The one that causes positional annoyance is Backfire. This is a tail swipe that whips out 30 yards, 90 degrees from his back end. Well, that would be if it worked intentionally. A portion of this cone clips through the front of the boss, meaning your tank is also in danger of getting knocked back. Generally being three yards away from the center makes it safe, but that is a current known annoyance. This will deal damage and launch anyone affected by it 45 yards. And his main tank concerning ability is Corrupted Breath. This is a 90 degree frontal cone that applies a dot that stacks with more applications of, meaning tank swapping does have value in this situation. When the boss reaches 80%, this is where it deviates. You can either attempt to play by the book and progress in the fight as intended, or you can opt to cheese. If you go the route of how the fight is intended, the boss casts Animated Flame. Five fire adds spawn, when they die, they leave a fire patch. After spawning the adds, the boss begins a cast called Lucid Dreaming. The channel completes after 20 seconds, where everyone will be brought down into the dream phase. Unless you have killed those fire adds and stood in the fire that they have produced on the ground, giving you a debuff called On Fire, forcing you to move forward and take fire damage. The moment he is done casting Lucid Dream in this situation, it will immediately remove the debuff On Fire and leave you in the up phase. Anyone who was not On Fire by the time Lucid Dreaming had completed the cast would be sent down into the Dream Realm. Hey yo, go to sleep. In the Dream Realm, Periodically, you will deal with falling rocks. You have a travel time, they're projected, you can move out of them. And you will find Morphaz immobile on the side of the room, as well as five Nightmare Vine targetable objects. In this phase, Morphaz takes 100% increased damage, and those Nightmare Vines produce a dream portal that brings you back up to the real phase. The problem, though, is if more than five people are down into the dream phase, each dream portal has one charge. Why is that a problem? Since getting down here, Morphaz has been channeling a cast called Eternal Slumber. This instantly kills anyone in the dream phase the moment the cast completes. If you don't have enough portals to get everyone out, you're sacrificing people. Or so you would think. You see that fire up top holds way more importance. If you push this phase and didn't kill any fire elementals, the portals are a means to go do that. If one is killed and someone stands in that fire patch, they can run with their on fire debuff into the sleeping players of the raid. This will wake them up immediately dispelling their own on fire in the process. And this can be repeated for everyone down in the dream phase. The fire elementals, if alive, and fire patches persist throughout the entirety of this transition and despawn the moment that it ends. Once everyone is out of the lucid dreaming phase, he cancels his cast and goes back to doing normal mechanics. Well, what's the cheese phase then? Well, since it takes him 20 seconds to cast lucid dreaming, and the hideaway at the arches of this boss area are available to people, because you need to have room to be there while he's roaming around and not get locked out, you can opt to go to those arms near the beginning, before he completes his lucid dreaming cast. Line of sight it entirely, and skip the down phase outright. Just have all the fire adds come to you, kill them. If you get ran out during lucid dreams casting, you're immune to it because you're on fire. And bonus, if you do it in this cheesy way, you don't get the damage up time you would get on Morphaz with five people at 100%, but you do get 100% up time with 20 people on Hazad until he completes this 30 second channel of eternal slumber that does nothing in the real phase. It is a win-win, no risk, full damn. You repeat the same stuff you were doing in phase one up until 30%, where he will again dart to the center of the room. This time do a four second cast for lucid dreaming. Now, if you did this as intended, everyone would go down into the dream phase. Morphaz would be there ready to take 100% increased damage. But in that 30 seconds, you would have to kill him as there is no other way out of the dream phase. And if you fail to do so, you wipe. Or you can, yet again, cheese in line of sight at the arches at the entrance and beat on Hazaz with no penalty whatsoever till he's like low 10% and just kill him regular. Why do I say the fight feels unpolished or unfinished? The fight initially being unkillable in the way it was intended and lucid dreaming not ignoring line of sight. 
To bring a boss from 30% to 10% that's taken 100% increased damage just feels bad. So I guess it was a good thing that Lucid Dreaming didn't ignore Line of Sight, so this kill was possible initially. Post health nerf. Of the first 100 kills on this boss, there are 7 recorded kills with the intended method. So as of now, it is technically possible. But because this exploit was discovered, it's the trend as of current. FYI, phase 2, the intended way is the par strat. Damage increase, duh. Choose whichever method works for you, unless Blizzard decides to add ignore line of sight to lose the dreaming, then you're forced to on to the next fight. The Shade of Aranicus. The jank just keeps on giving. Okay, trust me on this when I say you want to tank this boss in a particular spot. It'll become very apparent as to why in phase two onward. Get the boss to come to the left front corner of the room. Then have your tank pivot to the middle column's corner on the incline. This will cause Aranicus to walk up and around onto that lip next to the wall. This is already half the battle. Why? Okay, I'll give up the ghost. Later in the phase, when you decide to spawn ads every 15 seconds, they spawn in directions around him at a decent distance. Notice how he had to go up and around to get to the tank? That slope between him and the floor is non-traversable terrain. Anything projected from him to spawn elsewhere will stop at that point. Thus, the majority, if not all ads, will spawn directly on top of the center of his hitbox, making them very easy to manage. Non-traversable terrain means the mob can't go there. You can fall down the slope. Hell, if you get caught in the center of the slope, the mob would out of bounds you. But they can never go there, and they can never cross it. You are still going to need two tanks for this fight. With the setup out of the way, let's get on to the abilities. Corrosive Breath is a 4 second cast. Cast every 15 to 20 seconds. This leaves a debuff on the tank that reduces their armor by 100%. This is your taunt swap. Deep Slumber is a cast that targets 3 people outside of the boss's melee range. Unless everyone for some reason is within melee range. As long as there are enough range, it'll target them. I think it only requires three, but that's TBD. This casts a slow traveling bolt of green to the location of those ranged players. When it lands, it produces a cloud. If a person makes contact with this cloud, it'll put them in a stun for 15 seconds, reducing their damage taken and healing received by 99%, and regenerate their mana at 1% every one second. These clouds last for one minute. This is a necessary mechanic to counter a waking nightmare, that when its cast is complete, it'll deal 30,000 damage to anyone who isn't in a sleep and when it goes off, it'll wake them up. This ability in particular can be LOS'd. Your off tank can be in an LOS spot, close to where they need to be, and your tank in the corner can jump down to the cloud, or ride the line to get into LOS on the other side of that beam. His next ability is Lethargic Poison. This deals significant nature damage over time, reduces your hit chance, and increases the cost of all your abilities by double. This hits eight people, and should be cleansed as soon as possible. This is cast at intervals between 15 and 20 seconds. Tail Swipe is a knockback that deals damage. If you do this right, only your off tank and respectively your main tank will have to deal with this. Bellowing Roar is hugely important. That's between every 30 to 60 seconds and should be interrupted. If it goes off, everyone in the raid will be feared for 6 seconds. If it goes off, dispel your tank immediately, as this can botch positioning. Anywhere between a half minute to a minute and a half, he can cast Thrash, which is mollywop the tank with two extra attacks instantly. At 70%, he'll go into an intermission called Deep Slumber. He will become inactive for 20 seconds and take 99% reduced damage. During this time, he'll summon two Lumbering Dreamwalkers. They will cast their own versions of Deep Slumber and Lethargic Poison. They can both be interrupted, and they can definitely be stunned. They should be focus fired down as they are the only thing worth damaging at this point in time. Immediately after his 20 second rest has completed, he will now summon eight Welts every 15 seconds. They will attempt to cast Acid Shot on people. Though this does do mild damage, they should be AoE down because if left unchecked, they can pile up and become a nuisance. At 40%, he goes into another intermission. You deal with another set of Lumbering Dreamwalkers, and when he comes out of this state, he will summon instead of Welts, there will be three Scalebanes in their place. These should also be interrupted and stunned. They have a cast called Acid Rain, which will cause a damaging effect to slowly make its way down to where people are standing, projected on the ground, causing a need for movement. You continue handling him in the Scale Banes until 10%, where on top of the Scale Banes, he will also summon the Whelps again. This is a burn phase before you become overwhelmed. In summary, keep your tanks alive. Cleanse the Lethargic Poison, as the range group stagger step the cloud placement throughout the fight. Be ready to jump in a cloud when Waking Nightmare happens. Interrupt Bellowing Roar. Phase 1 Transition. Stun, Interrupt, Kill, Adds. Phase 2. AoE down whelps, kill boss. Still do mechanics. Transition the same as the first. AoE lock down the scale banes till 10%. AoE to manage the adds or nuke down the boss. And that is Aranicus. Now that's a solid 7 out of 8. 
Would be a shame if you couldn't do eight out of eight, right? Somebody did the quest, yeah? You have the egg, don't you? Oh no. Well, for those of you that do, Avatar of a car is around the corner. For those of you that don't, have fun with the quest chain. Sort of an anticlimactic stopping point. So here we are, Avatar of Hakar. Yes. The encounter begins with you turning down four Hakari ritualists. They do nothing but soak damage. Have at it. The moment the last one is killed, the Hakari Bloodkeeper becomes active. It gains a buff called Tides of Blood, gaining 3% of its mana every second. When it reaches full mana, the real fight begins. During these 35 to 40 seconds that he is here, roughly every 18 seconds he will cast Spirit Chains. This is an 8 second long curse. This is applied to two people. That when it expires or is dispelled, anyone within 10 yards will get another curse. That will deal damage over time and reduce their attack, cast, and movement speed by 50%. Wait for the two people to get out of the group, decurse them when they are in a safe range, and decurse them again. Every 9 to 15 seconds, he will shoot out two slow-moving projectiles that will land on top of someone in your raid. This is called bubbling blood. This produces a placed AoE on the ground that pulsates damage in a 3-yard radius. These last for 10 minutes each. Try to bait them in a spot that's out of the way. Lastly is Frightsome Howl. This is a two second cast that can be interrupted that will fear everyone in the raid, as well as dealing 1.5k shadow damage. After 40 seconds of dancing with this Dratini, he will have reached full mana, where he commits Sudoku, and the avatar of Hakar is brought into the world. Half of the percentage of damage taken by the Bloodkeeper will be transferred to Hakar. There is seven seconds of RP before Hakar becomes active, meaning free DPS. Hakar has five abilities. Every 8 to 10 seconds, he will cast Blood Nova. This deals 500 shadow damage to everyone in the raid. Every 25 to 30 seconds, he will cast Insanity. This will cause one of your raid members to become hostile to everyone around them, but they can still attack the boss. However, since they are hostile to everybody, they cannot be healed by them. This lasts for 20 seconds, and you can get rid of it by spamming Dispel Magic on them. This will likely remove other buffs that they value. Seeing that Dire Maul buffs aren't a thing yet, it's safer to just purge the buffs off them. Yes, you could sheep to heal them. That's not complicated, unless you want to complicate it. Curse of Tongues is an ability he will cast roughly every 30 seconds. It is a curse that lasts for 15 seconds. Two people are hit with this at a time. It reduces casting speed by 50% and forces you to speak Greek. Now these last two abilities work in tandem. Corrupted Blood is cast every 15 seconds. This is a dot that pulsates damage every two seconds. and attempts to jump to anyone within eight yards of the affected players. This is initially applied to two people at a time meaning two people need to get away from everybody else within two seconds of getting this debuff. And they need to stick together in front of the boss, at any range in front of the boss. The ability that this works in tandem with is Drain Blood. This is a 100 yard, 30 degree cone in the boss's facing direction. At the end of its cast, it'll turn people into a skeleton, also removing the Corrupted Blood debuff. This is a four second cast that happens roughly every 35 seconds. The skeletal debuff reduces all your healing taken by 100 and increases your movement speed by 35%. It is wise to have two tanks for this fight, as every cast of drained blood will give you the skeletal debuff regardless of whether you have corrupted blood or not, where if you solo tank you will have six second windows where your tank cannot be healed. To handle the corrupted blood in drained blood, everyone who gets the corrupted blood will stack behind the tank and get their blood drained. Prior to the blood draining, everyone with corrupted blood should be topped off. So in the window where they cannot be healed, they won't die to a blood nova or a reapplication of corrupted blood. And that is all the mechanics to the avatar of a car fight. You purge mind controls, you decurse curse of tongues, corrupted bloods pile behind the tank far enough not to spread it to them, and you top off those targets before they get drained blood. Also mildly healing the raid through the blood nova damage. You do this for about eight minutes and you have beaten Hakar. Huzzah! That is all of Sunken Temple. What a wild and janky ride it has been. The boss despawned? The boss despawned and we got no loot! Oh whoa, uwu, oh whoa. Error cube, what is your wisdom? It is ready. When it is ready. On with the outro. Like, comment, and subscribe. Here are the sources and content I have used. I still eat a ton of footage from these guys. Don't hate me. Heart emoji. Huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. Canalator, Moose, Shikishima, and Ringle. Link to my Twitch and Patreon. And I will see you again soon. TM.